So first off, I just want to say, like, I think when I was reading through this chapter with R6, I thought it was a little bit more approachable than S3. Um, although, like, through our conversation, I felt that I've got a better grasp of S3. But like, when I first read R6, I was like, okay, this is, uh, I could grasp this a little bit more. And so I feel a little bit more confident with this one. Um, but just what I think we should get out of our conversation today is I think we should be able to discuss how to construct our, an R6 class, which is pretty mm -hmm. straightforward. Um, also be able to overview like the different mechanisms of an R6 class. So things like initialization. So these different methods like initialization, print, making fields and methods public and private, and then talking about active fields and methods. Also, I kind of want to spend some time observing some various examples of using these mechanisms to create R6 classes, objects, fields, and methods. And so there was a there was an exercise where I thought was kind of interesting trying to use R6 to model uh, like a bank account. And so some of the examples that I share today are my approach to solving those problems with R6. And so um, and then obviously some observe some of the consequences of reference semantics. So I really appreciate uh, everybody jumping in with my question, dealing with reference semantics and um, some of the other stuff that I prompted earlier because I was kind of getting a little mixed up between like copy on modify versus reference semantics and how that related to R6 classes and objects. And I think I have a better sense of it now, but definitely something that we can talk a little bit more about. And then the last part is review some of the arguments on why we should use um, R6 over reference classes, because the book talks about that there's a really, that those two things are very similar. Um, and so the book tried, tries to make an argument of why should you use R6 over RC if it's already built in. So we can talk about those. So um, hmm. but before we, before we dive into this, I think what I, I, I was kind of going through some of the old cohorts materials mm -hmm. and one of them kind of brought up this concept of the four pillars of OOP. And I thought this was like a really good framework that helped me like center myself around object oriented programming design and how these kind of systems fit into this. And so I thought this was kind of a good reminder and a good kind of concept that was brought up, but really you have the four pillars of OOP, the idea of abstraction, uh, polymorphism, which we've already kind of talked a little bit about, uh, inheritance, which will, look at inheritance, especially when we have like super classes and subclasses in R6 and encapsulation, which encapsulation, uh, our R6 really leans on using encapsulation for its fields and methods. And so, uh, and I also thought this was really neat because I went down this rabbit hole of watching YouTube videos about people trying to explain OOP. Um, someone had this really interesting uh, mnemonic. Yeah, mnemonic for remembering the four pillars of OOP. It's it's just like a pie, right? Abstraction, polymorphism, inheritance, and encapsulation. So I thought that was kind of a neat way to remember the four pillars of OOP. Um, so just as a quick review, this is just a different paradigm than what we've been used to, right? Um, we were talking about functional programming, uh, not uh, previously before S3. And just as a reminder, we're kind of in this new paradigm or this different paradigm of OOP, and it's just a different way to um, program in. So, so we talked about S3. Uh, last time we talked about that there are many different ways to do object-oriented programming in R, uh, mainly because R, when it was first initially created, it didn't really have OOP built into it. And so as it kind of matured as a language, more and more people started saying, okay, let's integrate different ways to do OOP. S3 was, a, was one of those. R6 is another one, and then S4, which we'll talk about next week. But R6, um, when it comes to R6, R6 is not built into base. It's not a base package. And so um, there are some consequences if you decide to use R6 for your um, object-oriented programming. Is First, it's a separate package. So um, if you do decide to use this, you're going to have to install it and then attach it. But the other thing that I think is important is, is that if you are going to integrate using R6 classes in a package, so if you're developing an R package, you have to make sure that R6, because it is a package, now becomes a dependency within your package. And so you have to add that in your description file. And so whether that be a consequence that you should focus on, it's just something to take into consideration because it's not built into the base R, 
And so you have to add it to your description file because it now becomes a dependency within your package. So your users, when they download your package and install it and attach it, they also have to install R6 because it is a dependency. Um, there's two kind of special properties about R6 is that it uses that encapsulated OOP paradigm. And really that really, what that kind of comes down to is, is that methods belong to objects, not generics. Um, when we were talking about S3, S3 focused on generics and using metadata through attributes to determine which methods get dispatched for specific objects. And so, but instead with R6, methods are part of the objects and so the dispatch happens within the object, if I'm saying that correctly. Um, so when you think about it, when you want to call a field or a specific method from an object, you have to use this kind of this kind of syntax, right? So here's the object that's created from the R6 class. Here's the method call, and then it performs whatever function or however you defined it inside the class. R6 objects are mutable, so they're modified in place. Uh, they follow reference semantics, which we'll talk about. There are some consequences if you decide to use R6, especially because they follow reference semantics rather than copy on modify behavior. Um, and some of them may not be as intuitive until you actually see them um, in practice. And then the other thing is, is that if you come from another language, which I do not, but I know that there are some people here who have relied on like Python, um, R6 is very similar to other languages that have uh, OOP, kind of follow an OOP paradigm. And actually reading through this chapter and kind of understanding these concepts, I now understand Python a little bit more and how it actually works. So I really appreciated this kind of discussion because it was like, oh, I under kind of better understand that that's a different type of programming paradigm, that it uses a different programming paradigm than R does. And so the syntax is going to be a little bit different. So um, the other thing that was brought up in this chapter is, is that although R6 is similar to other languages and it's easier to write, just know that it's going to lead to non-idiomatic R code. And so what does that mean? <clears throat> Basically, the, like, the common use R is not going to be as familiar with the syntax. And so if you decide to write a package like this, you may, it may not be usable because other people may not be as familiar with using this type of syntax that R6 <clears throat> forces you to use. And so a good example of this is um, Microsoft 365 R. Uh, so if you never use this, it's basically Microsoft's like R package to interact with like Microsoft 365 like package or like uh, services and stuff. But uh, when I started using this and I wasn't as familiar with R6, I started reading through it. And so it starts kind of like walking you through and showing you how to do this. And you start seeing these method calls. And before I knew what OOP was in like R code and how it was used, I was like, why are we using this dollar sign syntax? Like dollar sign syntax is used for subsetting. It's used for getting variables. Like why are we all of a sudden doing this now? And it's a function call. And it just goes back to that fact of like, you know, this package is, is using R6 classes to create R6 objects, but the trade-off is being that it's not, you know, what I'm used to. I'm not used, you know, I'm not used to using this dollar sign syntax to call a method to do something. And so it was kind of a hurdle that I couldn't know how to use this package because I didn't really understand R6. So there is a trade-off to this and the book kind of mentions like, hey, just know that use the typical use R is not going to be as familiar with this as like somebody who's more of a developer and understands R6. So <clears throat> any any questions or um, any comments that people want to add about kind of the introduction to R6? Thank you nailed it. Sweet. Cool. Yeah, right, I mean, move on. That, you, oh, you, get, you had a better grasp than me, that's for sure. I think it's just, I think it's just like comes down to like, I was a little nervous when I first did it. And there are some trade offs that I do want to talk about a little bit later because I was trying to integrate this into a package that I was creating. And I was like, uh, this is getting really away from functional programming. And I was a little afraid about like the people that I work with because they're more comfortable with functional programming than they are OOP. And I was like, eh, 
I don't know if I want to go down this route right now, unless like I worked with a group of people that really understood it, but okay, cool. So how do we construct an R6 class? Well, it's, it's really kind of straightforward with R6. Uh, you just call the R6 class function. Okay. And so here's the example from the book. It creates this function called accumulator. Um, two important arguments that you really want to be aware of is the first one, which is the class name. Uh, this is just a string used to name the class. It's not needed, but the book suggests it. And it mainly suggests it uh, just in the case of error handling. So if something happens with your R6 class and it pushes an error, uh, the user knows basically which, which class object or which class is being affected. So it suggests to use this. In addition to that, with this first simple example, it provides this argument called public. And public is just basically a list. And it's a list where you include your methods, which are just functions, and fields, which is anything else, right? And so in our case here with this accumulator example, we have this sum field, which starts off with the value zero. And then we have this method called add, which is just a function, right? We're just adding, you know, we're just adding up uh, we're just adding up X, what gets passed to X into sum. And so every time that we run this, or run this add method, sum increases by one. So really, really kind of straightforward. There were some style conventions that were mentioned with this, um, which I thought was kind of interesting too, because um, I'm going to share some examples with you and my, uh, my, my linter kind of highlights these issues, which I'm trying to figure out how to fix. Um, but basically, like anytime you create a class name, it really suggests that you should use upper camel case. So accumulator doesn't have two like nouns in it or anything like that or two verbs. But if it had an additional word like accumulator sum, you would just you know double capitalize it. Any of your methods should follow uh, snake case, so underscores. And then the other thing that the book suggests is that always assign your R6 class into a variable of the same name. Um, I think that just makes sense because when someone wants to create a new object using your class, they'll be calling the class object. So I think that just makes intuitive sense. And then anytime that you want to access a field inside of a method, you need to use this self call. So self dollar sign this, right? Because if you don't, then it won't access the actual field value in your public method or in your in your public list. And this is really important because I'm going to share something that I kind of dug into a little bit more about how R6 works, which I thought was kind of interesting, is R6 really leverages um, environments to uh, set these field and methods. And I thought this was really kind of neat. And so for you to access this, you're actually accessing a separate environment. And so it's really kind of cool how that works on the back end. And so we'll talk a little bit about that a little bit later down the road. So what questions do people have about um, like creating an R6 class or simple R6 class or comments? All right, cool. Let's talk about constructing. So constructing is really easy. Um, <laughs> Uh, all you have to do is just you have to call anytime. So you've defined your class. And so if you want to create an object with an R6 class, you just use the new method. And so if we wanted to create a new object X based off of this R6 class, we would just call accumulator question mark new. And then we have this object X, right? Or we have this R6 object assigned the name X. Now, if we wanted to call the method that is inside of this class, we can just call it with a dollar sign, add four. And then if we wanna call the value after we do this method call, we could just do X dollar sign sum, which returns four, right? Pretty straightforward, um, pretty intuitive how it all works, but just it's just that call to new to create that new object. So I think that's pretty straightforward, but what's really nice about this is when you are defining your um, R6 classes, um, we wanna make sure that we, when we define our methods, we want to return objects invisibly because that allows for um, method chaining. So the example is with accumulator is, and then we can go back to this, <clears throat> because right here, because I'm returning self invisibly, 
what this allows us to do is it allows us to chain our methods together. And so we can chain them to do multiple operations um, in like one line. And so this example being, you know, we're adding 10. So we have this object or we have this R6 object with the name X. We're adding 10 with the add method, adding another 10. And then we're just going to sum it together, which because I did four before, it's now 24. Uh, what's nice about this, this is kind of like the pipe. It kind of helps to improve readability. So you can keep applying methods to it by just doing this dollar sign. And then at the end, you can call that sum field at the end of all of your method calls to get your new 44. So I thought that was kind of neat is, is that you can chain these together. And I think that's how this Microsoft 365 R thing still works. It's like, it allows you, I think there were some examples where you can chain a bunch of steps together to do like certain things with it, so. Hmm. Um, any questions about method chaining or like the creating R6 objects? No, I, I, I just taking it in. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's this part of it's just like, you know, um, why create this? You can do all of these things, you, you know, just as, I mean, seemingly just as easy without creating a new method, but I, you know, the use cases are. And I think what's, I think what's in, so we'll get to that conversation a little bit later, but I think it comes back to like the four pillars. I think it comes mm -hmm. back to this idea of encapsulation and abstraction, mm -hmm. right? right? So you can encapsulate everything into its like own class so that it's like, you know, it's encapsulated in that. So like when you think about your entire package or your entire analysis or your entire script it doesn't bleed over into other things and ron help me out because this is getting into yeah, the computer I mean, science I, I, well. say, I think these r6 objects are probably more used in r in cases where you need to um i was trying to word i'm trying to think of encapsulate i don't want to use the word encapsulate i mean the, in the formal sense i mean you want to capture or abstract away uh some other thing that has state like for example the, you deal with microsoft 365 it has some state so you want to abstract that and this kind of captures that stateful nature to it when you you know you call a method on something and you're not getting something back like you would in a normal functional style you're actually doing something to the world out there so it kind of represents that it represents it, it's a little encode representation of some actual stateful thing out there that's when this r6 seems to be very useful in r so for example in shiny or in 365 or places like that where you're interacting with outside things and you want to represent that capture that concept in code our six objects are great for that not that you can't do it with a pure functional style but it's much harder because you have to keep passing the state around and remember that's not a real state and things like that but this yeah that's kind of how i think so I, you obviously would never use it for this concept here of adding 10 it, it's just just for it's just a toy example to illustrate the syntax right yeah, I like that idea of like maintaining state, like, and I think the book kind of mentions that like when they did like a total rewrite of Shiny, like Shiny has to maintain state, right? It has to maintain like, so if you know Shiny, it's all about inputs and outputs. And so like your user inputs something which changes your code, you know, it runs certain code and then like it maintains the state of the Shiny app or the UI or whatever it is. And so R6 is really kind of one of the big like, back-end power horses that abstracts all that stuff out so you don't have to think about it. Um, another good example of this that I, I kind of heard about that idea of abstraction is, is like, think about like a DVD player, right? You don't necessarily need to think about how a DVD, I don't know if anybody uses DVD players, but this is the example that they gave, was like, you don't need to know the internals of how a DVD player works. You just put your, you just put your DVD in it and push play, right? And so everything inside of it just works and you just have to pass it the correct information. And so then it just works. And so that's kind of like what I was thinking about R6 is it helps abstract away all that other stuff that people don't necessarily need to know to do. Um, again, I'm, I'm saying some stuff very confidently. So <laughs> I don't know OOP design is probably some other people, but that's just one example that I got about it. So. Hmm. 
So some other useful methods when it comes to creating your own R6 class is print. So print modifies the default printing method. So if you want a very specific way to print your output, you can use this print method, which I'll show you here an example. Um, and then anytime that you do modify the print, you should return invisible self again to allow for that method chaining to take place. And then there's this concept of the initialize method. Um, this overrides the default behavior of new. And what's really important about initialize is it provides you the ability to validate certain inputs. So obviously part of the R6 interface is users are gonna be putting in input to build their R6 object. And so you wanna validate those inputs. And so that's what initialize, that is what initialize allows you to do is to validate some of those inputs. So um, I thought this was, so there was, there was uh, an exercise in the book that really talked about like creating a bank account, like trying to use an R6 object to model a bank account. And so I thought, oh, this might be a really good example to kind of talk through to kind of emphasize how to use these kind of concepts. And so what I've done here is I've created a bank account class, um, just called it bank account. And here in my public um, list, I have three fields, owner, type, and balance. Obviously, if you create a new account, you're gonna have a zero balance and then you will deposit. Um, and then I do, I use this initialize method here to validate my inputs, right? So two things that I want to receive anytime that somebody's going to create a new bank account object is I want an, I want an owner's name and I want the type, right? Because you could have like a savings or a checking account, whatever. Um, but here's some just validation checking, right? So making sure that it is character, making sure that, you know, you at least have um, like something in that owner object, so on and so forth. And it's not just like an empty object, like a an NA character or whatever. But then in my public, I define two methods. I define deposit and withdraw. And when you think of methods within R6, they're just functions. They're just functions like we're used to, just defined in a different way. And in this case, what I'm doing here is anytime you deposit, you're adding the amount. And anytime you withdraw, you're subtracting the amount. Both return invisible, so we can do method chaining. So you could do, you know, complex transactions with a withdraw or deposit, whatever, whatever. And then it just sets the balance by assigning self balance and then changing that field as the object does more method calls so on and so forth. So um, how does this work? Well, here's some examples for you. Um, so here, all I'm doing is I'm creating a new object called Colin Savings. I do bank account new. Obviously I have to pass the owner name, which is Colin, uh, what type of it is, it's savings. And then I deposit $10 into my account and then I just print it out. And here's the default printing method, right? So you can modify this, which we'll do here in a second, but basically this is the default printing method for an R6 object. So you can see the field names, um, clone, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, especially this is really important if you want to copy a specific object, um, but here's the deposit initialize, but then you can see the other fields like owner type, which I'm not sure why this is null now that I'm looking at it. That shouldn't be null. Hmm, maybe something to look at here in a second, but those should be assigned. Huh, well, that kind of threw me off. Maybe we could look at that a little bit later, but, um, you can see I have $10 in here. If I wanna do the withdraw method, withdraw 10, print it out again, I get a balance of zero. And I think I know why this is null, um, but I'll talk about that here in a second. So pretty straightforward. Like you just create it with new and then you just run your methods by doing this and then you pass whatever the method requires to perform its, to form its uh, calculations or whatever it needs to do. So, you can modify the print, which this is what this does. Um, all of this is basically the same again when we talk about our R6 class. Uh, here are the field names, here's the initialize. In my case here, and I think this is the issue that I had is I didn't put these in the initialize before. And so that's why it was null when I created my new object. And so 
this is the same deposit method, the same withdraw is the same. But now what I'm doing is I'm modifying this print function here so that I take self owner, self type, self balance. And then when I do the print method, it will just basically return um, a different printing method of how you want it to look. And so I'm going to jump over here as an example so we can talk about it here. Um, make sure I got R6 in here. And I'm going to first define this one here. And then I'm going to just do some of this here, print it out just like we saw before, withdraw back down to zero. But then if I want to modify the print, um, so I just modified it. This is the same definition with print, bank account. Um, now, if I run this here, here's my savings account, but let's say I create one for Hadley, I create them a checking account, and I run this again, the printing behavior is modified. Now, this is really important to remember that because of reference semantics, and when I created this object, Colin Savings, and once I redefined this bank account class, this Hadley checking is now going to have this print method. And this one's going to have the old print method because again it doesn't do copy on modify it's based on reference semantics so i'll just show it to you again if i whoops if i try and print this on savings you'll see that it's this one but if i do hadley checking it's to my print method for my new class definition so that's really important to recognize is that it's based on when it was defined the class was and what the methods and fields are going to be and that's due to reference semantics, I think, because I'm still kind of like keeping that stuff um, uh, organized in my mind. So any questions about like modifying the print method and how reference semantics versus copy on modify affects that? Thanks. Right. Makes sense when you say it. Or, I think you I think you have to create your first R6 class and once you create it 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 starts making a lot of sense. I mean it's just it's just it's functions and and objects just written in, in a different way. But anyway, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off there, Ryan. No, not at all, man. You 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 said it all. But Wait. I yeah, I agree. I I did not I read but I did not dig in, so yeah, this is still conceptual, but not really pragmatic for me. I think the other thing that you need to kind of, the, the other thing that I think really made it click for me is really understanding the difference between a class, an object, a field, and a method. Because I think like when you look at this syntax, you're like, oh, this is an object bank account. It's not an object. It is a, well, it's a class you have to create an object. So like this class is, I'm gonna kind of say, it's kind of like a, well, it's a function that has data in it. What I type guess, of object is, way to is that? It. This object here, bank account? Yeah, do we know? Oh, that is a great question. I don't know, let's see. What is it, type of? Type of, I'm gonna guess that's an R6. So we're naming it bank account. It's an environment. Well, according to it is, type huh? of, but it, that's, that's a good point because this brings us up about how this actually works. And I highly suggest, I really highly suggest looking at, uh, I linked them here in these notes that I'll push to the repo, but Winston Chang did a talk back in 2017, um, uh, you know, how R6 is implemented. And it's only like 20 minutes long, but it, it really kind of digs into like how it actually works. And his kind of thing is, is like R6 objects are just environments with a particular structure. And so he kind of puts up this example and his is a little bit more simplified, but I tried to use like my R6 class, which was the bank account. It's just using different environments to organize information. So when it comes to like the initialize method, deposit method, withdraw or print or these fields, it gets put into this public environment. And then 
the functions are put into this enclosing environment to which if you want to access these in this different environment, you have to call self. It's just interesting. The bank accounts themselves are, I mean, the classes themselves are also objects. I didn't realize that, right? Because they're also environments, but so they're also objects. Like, I mean, they're all, everything in R is an object, but I mean, they're an R6 object. I didn't realize that. And it's all built on an environment to keep things organized, right? And so like, this is going to come back to an argument like of why you should use this over reference classes is because R6 really leverages different environments when RC doesn't. Oh, I just looked, I just looked and it turns out the, the classes have class, <laughs> uh, R6 class generator. So they're not R6 objects or R6 class generators, but they're still implemented with environments, which is interesting. Yeah. It, it, I, I highly suggest like watching that talk because it, it just it clicked for me. Do you really need to know this if you're if you're creating R6 classes? Probably not, but it's really I, interesting to kind of go ahead. Yeah, go ahead, Ron. Can you link that somewhere? Yeah, I I'll, Are I'll these push notes the already notes. up. Okay, yeah. Uh they're not yet, but I can put this copy link address. I can put this in the chat. Um Q. But yeah, he basically, he just has the saying, R6 objects are just environments with particular structure. So it's really kind of neat because we talk about these foundational concepts in R and it's just like this idea of like using these foundational structures to develop an OOP system, which is kind of neat. So I also thought what was really neat about this as well is this idea, remember environments call parents. And so what's kind of really cool about this is if you have other packages that have other R6 classes, technically you could inherit that behavior or those methods or the fields of other classes from other packages, as long as, you know, they are available in your R landscape or your R environment, because environments refer to their parents and that parent environment might be a package environment. So I thought that was really cool too, is that's just using that concept of environments to make this all work. And so, I don't know, Winston Chang, just some of the stuff he does, is just like, what, the shiny stuff that he's developed, is just like, just blows your mind. It's just like, wow, this, this guy is really, really, really like had a, lot, a huge impact with some of the stuff he creates. So, um, <clears throat> but again, like, if this is like, oh, is this too much? Like, you do you really need to know this? No, I just thought it was interesting once you see like his conversation about it because it goes back to those like foundational concepts. It's just using those data structures to create an OOP paradigm in R. Um, and then, it, and, it, and like, moreover, like R7 is gonna be like the new thing, right? So R6 is probably gonna go away because R7 is gonna be the new one. I'm sure it probably leverages. Well, wait, I think um, not because remember R7 is actually an S3 type of thing. It, it's a generic, it's not an encapsulate. So I think R6 will still be around. It certainly will be around. I watched like Hadley's talk about it. I think it's a mix between S, I don't know. I, I, I'm waiting in waters that I don't know a lot about, but. Um, oh, I didn't know that. I thought R7 was purely <laughs> uh not um you know not stateful or what's the word i forgot now but um yeah not, i might have doesn't have reference bounds. semantics that's what i meant to say so. oh yeah i might have overstepped my bounds so anybody who's watching this later just forget what i said i'm, I'm probably way out of bounds but that's what i, I remember <laughs> well when you have like r6 and then you're like r7 it's like oh well is it based on r6 that's one of the reasons why they <laughs> didn't want to call it that but then they realized i guess there was a discussion and S7 was more confusing whatever they're going to go with before. So, yeah, well, it's, we're, we're constrained by the fact that these systems were generated, not as part of like S and then R. Yeah. And then it's mm -hmm. just like, we're, these were like, after the fact, somebody was like, Hey, OOP is this new paradigm. Can you build it into R? Okay. Mm -hmm. And then it got so fractured with S3, S4, and I'm sure there's other ones, but in um, R6, now R7, it just becomes confusing. But once you accept the fact that like, oh, it's so fractured, it makes you feel a little bit better because it does get kind of confusing, so. Mm, yeah. Uh, okay, 
So what happens if you have like an R6 class and you, you already have an R6 class and you want to just, you know, create a new method without redefining the class? Well, you can do that with this set method. Um, you know, keep in mind that if you do decide to do this, any objects that you define later, again, due to reference semantics, um, won't have this new method unless you like redefine it. So just keep this in mind that you can do this, but any previous <laughs> objects using that old class definition is going to carry over um, that old like definition. It's not going to have this new method in it. So if accumulator, I want to add this new add, excuse me, method, I would just do set and then define the function add in here, however I want it. Interesting, directly applicable, I don't really know, but you have the capability to use this method to add um, new methods or new fields to your class classes if you want to. Um, okay, so inheritance. Uh, inheritance is, is pretty straightforward. So like, say you have a super class and you wanna create a subclass. Um, if you don't want to redefine methods or fields inside of your new subclass, you could just inherit it. And so um, I thought this was a great example using bank account because part of the exercise was like, hey, create a superclass bank account and then create another subclass that will, you know, stop you from overdrafting. And so what you can do is, is you can use inherit to pull in the definition of bank account and then define whatever um, methods or whatever you want inside of your new subclass. And then what you can do is, is you can reference all the stuff that was in bank account previously. And all you have to do is just do inherit equals whatever your class name was. And I also thought this was a really good opportunity because I was really struggling with this idea because I was already like, my mind was already blown with the idea of classes and, and how this all worked. And then I got to this idea of like, oh, well, you can also create subclasses. And so I was kind of struggling with this and I thought this was a good opportunity to show how debugging works at in R6. And this wasn't in the book, but I found this to be really useful. Um, if you wanted to, you can dump a browser inside of here. So like if you had a function call, you could dump a browser in here. Like there's a browser function if you're not familiar with. Um, I know we linked Jenny Bryant's conversation about this a lot earlier when she talks about browser. But say you don't want to edit your code, what you can do is, is you can use this um, debug method and target it to a specific method that you want to debug. And so you don't necessarily need to edit your code to put in a browser. You can just set it up like this create your new object, call your method, and then it will just throw you into uh, a debugger. And so you don't have to edit your code. The other thing is, is if you read into the docs about this with like, um, let me show you, there's like an actual debugging vignette in R6. It will tell you that you can't use breakpoints in R Studio to, to debug it. So breakpoints won't work. Um, so if you want to debug, you either need to dump a browser into your code or you need to use um, this debug method to do it. And so I thought this was a good kind of opportunity to show how this actually works um, with an example that I have here with the bank account thing. So let me jump over here real quick. So I was really struggling with this earlier. I'm actually going to go down to this bank account overdraft here. And so what I've decided to do is I'm just... I'm defining this new subclass called bank account overdraft. So define that. And then what I'm going to do is I'm just going to call this debug method on withdraw. And so here's my withdraw method. So if I run this and then I run withdraw, oops, uh, where's that? Oh, withdraw. So it's, it's working now overdraft, but then if I want to do, oh shoot, is that right? Debug debug. There it is. Okay. So now it dumped me in an interactive browser here. So basically what it did is it stopped me around this withdraw method. And so what I can do here is as I can interactively work within the scope of this 
um, method call. So if I wanted to, I could look at what is the amount in here right now. It's 20. What's my, you know, if I wanted to look at self question mark balance, I could look at that there, right? And so I could interactively work with the objects inside the scope of this withdraw method. Um, if I want to get out of my browser, I just quit, takes me back. Um, I got to jump back here real quick, sorry. And so that's just how you would do that targeted to like debug it. And so basically I found out that this wouldn't work. This was my first attempt at it. So then I fixed this, changed my method call, redefine it. And then if I do set it, well, turn off the debugger, create my new method, run this, it won't allow me to overdraft. It will throw an error and say, hey, you can't overdraft. Um, and that's because in my withdraw method, I have a conditional that basically says, hey, if you're trying to overdraft, you can't, you have to stop it. So um, I know I went just, oh, the other thing about debugging, you don't necessarily have to do it with new objects. You can throw like a debug method around a specific object and a method call and do it. And it still works. It will throw you into a debugger and you can kind of play around with like whatever you want inside of that method. That's so, cool. Yeah. Uh, it's really nice because again, you can't use breakpoints. So if you're familiar with breakpoints in our studio, they don't work. And if you don't want to like, you could, if you wanted to, let me go back here real quick, is you could dump a browser in here. Like if you wanted to in your method definition, you could dump a browser up here. Oops. Like you could dump a browser and it still works, but your code is messy. And so you have to go back and you have to delete this browser. Oops. And then, um, and then it's good to go, right? So, uh, so there's just some testing with that, so on and so forth. Um, but yeah, it gave a really good opportunity to see how debugging works. I know the book doesn't really talk about it, but when I was trying to create this in a package that I was trying to put an R6 class in it, this was really helpful because I was like, uh, I don't know how to call certain fields and certain methods and stuff. So, but any questions about how I did inheritance or how I like did debugging here. Cool. So if you want to do some introspection, so um, if you want to like peer into like some of the internals of it, you can use. Um, so like if you, I didn't really understand this concept and I don't know if somebody can explain it to me some more, but like every R6 object has an S3 class that reflects its hierarchy in R6 classes. I wasn't totally, I didn't really completely understand that, but. Um, well, when the, the class attributes of these things are truly the S3 classes, right? And that's important. Like when you call print, right? It's actually calling the S3 R6 object generic, which then in turn calls the print method on your object, for example, right? You are, you are correct. Because now if I look at my call and savings here, it's it's looking at our the r6 class or no it starts with bank account right so it's got an s3 it class R6. it's actually got a s3 class called bank account and it's got s3 class r6 that that hierarchy from s3 is still there i think it's the r6 method that gets called for like print and things uh okay that's interesting okay cool um, and if you want to like see all of the like methods and fields, you can just call names on it. So, which I think is important because names is a generic, right? So names is a generic function. Yeah. And because we have Colin savings, this class R6, it knows what method to dispatch it to because it's R6 to give us the names for it, right? Yeah, exactly. Oh, right. Sweet. Okay. And then Here's that in closing environments. The book says, hey, don't worry about this. This is an internal implementation. Well, there you it is. now see. There it is. So yeah. <laughs> kind of neat to kind of see. It's just, it's so, it's like, it, it's just interesting to see how this all works. It really is. Um, so we can also control access. So um, there are also two other additional arguments that are available to us. There's the private and then the active. And so private creates fields and methods that are only available within the class. And I'll have an example to kind of show how this works um, with our bank account example. So if I want to create a bank account number that's only read only, 
um, I could use this private, uh, this private kind of method call to do that. Active um, allows you to use accessor functions to define dyna dynamic or active fields. So the book really talked about like, say if you wanted a method that randomly called a number every time, you would put that in an active field because then it will actively be able to do that every time you call that method call. So I also use this to do the bank account thing. So I'll show that here once I kind of get through some of this boilerplate stuff. Um, so for privacy, like you have private fields and methods. And so these are elements that can only be accessed, accessed from within the class, not from the outside. So um, they're only internal to the class that you create. And so like other R objects that are in your R landscape, because those are private inside of your class and inside of any objects that you create, other objects can't call it and use it. So when it comes to the private, um, the interface is the same as public. It's just a list of methods and functions. And then, um, but instead, when you implement this, if you want to call something that's a private method or a field, you have to use private dollar sign, right? And it goes back to that idea of it's a separate environment. It's putting those private elements in its own environment. So you have to use a new way to kind of reference it. Um, why might you want to keep your methods and fields private? Um, one reason, you know, you want to be clear on what's okay to others to access and not access, right? So if it's a private field, you're telling other developers to be like, hey, don't access this outside of the, of the class, okay? It's just kind of like a safety mechanism. The other thing is, is that like, it's good to use private methods because you know, as a developer, that if you have a private method or a private field, if you need to refactor that class for any reason, you can do that safely because you know other things and other people's R landscapes is not access, accessing it because it is a private field or private method. And so it makes your code easier to refactor later down the road. And so I thought that was kind of an interesting concept of like, hey, why would you use a private method? Oh, well, if you need to refactor it some other time, it's a lot safer to do that because you know other things are not relying on it. So, uh, and then the last thing before we share our example is the idea of active fields. You know, active fields allow you to define components that look like fields, but from the outside, they're just functions. So they're just like methods. They're gonna return a value, but how you do that is you define it as a function. Um, and so it's implemented using active bindings. I wasn't really clear what that necessarily meant, but I think it has to deal with that. If you do define something that's active, it's in a separate environment. And then, um, and anytime that you use like an active method, you need to use like value as an argument. You have to pass value as an argument into it. What are these great for? They're great for situations where you need additional checks or different validations. Or the other example, which I'm gonna share here in a second, is say you will only want to create a read only field you can use active fields to create like read only so like you can run a method to set an active field and then when you do that you can say like hey if somebody runs this again don't let it overwrite it and so i thought that was kind of neat now i'm sure there's probably a better way to do this but this was the example that i had with like the bank account is like, okay, what if I wanted to create a bank account number field that was private? Um, and so that's what I did here. Um, obviously I'm, I'm creating this private account number here in initialize and I create an active field method, which this method basically is just like doing a conditional where it's like, hey, if this is empty, give it a new account number else stop it so it doesn't overwrite it but then this account field is private so you only have this account number that's in a private field so you can't like access it you can't access it outside of the class or outside of the object that's only in that object and so um so here's the example running it like this do 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 and again, there's probably a more sophisticated way to do this, but this is how I thought about doing it. But let's just say I define this new, this new um, bank account thing. Let's say I create a new savings account for myself. And then let's say I want to give it an account number. So I give it an account number here. 
if I print it, you can see that I have my account number associated with it. But then if I try and give it a new account number, it will say, hey, account number is already assigned because it's read only and it's private, right? And so this account number, because it's specific to this object of this class, it can't be accessed by anybody else. I don't know. That was my implementation you idea. You, you could Go have ahead. done that with a balance too, right? Because you shouldn't be able to just add money to your balance from the outside. Ooh, that's a good way to think of it too. Like if you wanted to make your balance, yeah, that makes sense. Cause you don't want to be able to have other things. Like when you think of like system at large, you don't want it to interact with the balance field too. So I don't know. There's probably more sophisticated ways to do this, but I was like, oh, using the exercise, this might be an example of where you might use a private field and method. So cool. Yeah, I, I actually kind of had a lot of fun with this one. I was a little nervous about it, but I was like, oh, this kind of makes intuitive sense of why you would use this. Um, where are we at? We got about five minutes left. Here's just a brief example. I tried to map this out with active and private fields. I don't know if this is correct because I what I don't know is if it does create new environments for your active binding and your private binding. So don't necessarily trust this, but this was like, in my mind, this is what I think is happening is it's just anytime that you have an active or private binding, it gets put into its own separate environment. I could test this, but I just didn't have enough time to play around with it, so, but I don't know, any ideas? Do you think I got it? Do you think this is what you think is happening? I didn't think it was a separate environment, but I, you know, I just thought it was just, uh, just it just recognized, it just short circuits whenever you try to access a field instead of doing that, it just calls this function. I mean, a lot of programming languages have this, like they're called getter and setters, I think, um, and a lot of other object-oriented programming languages. And there's kind of usually some special syntactic sugar for that, just like this. Although now that I'm thinking about it, I have no idea how R implements that. So maybe it does require some, some magic <laughs> meta. I, I, I don't know. I mean, I would think like if you yeah, have a curious. private binding. Yeah, I'm curious about this, if it would create like its own separate environment. So. If anybody's watching this later, don't, yeah. don't trust this. Don't trust this. This was like my half-baked idea of how I think it might be working with active and private fields. And I don't know, but maybe I, this might have been a bridge too far for my mental model <laughs> of understanding how this works. Um, I feel like it's probably see. some weird environment thing. Just like changing the binding environment so that when you try to access it through the name, it actually is pointing to the function and then it points to the actual one. Because I'm pretty sure, isn't that how Shiny is implemented, right? The, if you try to access the field name and the input, it actually goes to some function that checks to see whether or not you're, um, whether or not you're using it inside the, um, Enclosing environment or not the enclosing environment, the like the observer environments uh, inside of an observer function. Yeah, maybe if I if I'm following you, like the reactive environment, like yeah, yeah. So like when you like do input dollar sign and then the field name, it's not actually the field that you're looking at. It's of some function that checks to make sure that you're inside a reactive environment. And then if you are, then it it lets you access the real value. Otherwise it stops you. You know, you might be onto something there because I always questioned why, like anytime that you were between your UI and your server function, why you had to do like the, like, you have to do that dollar sign notation with like input dollar sign, whatever your object is. It might be because of this, because it's using R6 and it's using those environments implemented by R6 and then part of that is to do some checking to be like, hey, are you in a oh, reactive yeah. environment? Yeah. Yeah. That is pretty slick. Okay. Is it, is it, are they overloading the um, dollar sign operator? Um, I don't think so because environments act like lists. So you can 
create an environment and then assign stuff inside of it like a list. So I think it actually is just an environment with like special stuff inside of it. Um, hmm, that's really cool. Well, uh, I don't know if John the Geek's hearing. I don't know if, if, if he wants to facilitate Winston Chang to come in, <laughs> come and talk to us. I think that might be an interesting person to kind of, because it sounds like he, I mean, with Shiny, like that makes sense, right? I don't know. Yeah. That's that's a good observation, Stone. I think I think that's how it is, but I'm not. I just got introduced to environments like two months ago, so. But I now that I'm thinking about the syntax wise, that might be what's actually happening. So that's really cool. I never thought of it that way. <laughs> well, we're right at five o'clock. Um, I don't want to go past the hour. Um, we do have just a couple more things to cover, which I think I could probably cover in 10, 15 minutes. It's mostly just some of the consequences of like reference semantics and some other things to take in consideration. So um, just to kind of give you, I think we'll just stop here because um, I think Ryan had to jump off too. I didn't check the chat, but um, so Stone, I got you for S4. Um, are you still good for that? Yep. Should be good. Um, are you guys using like uh, I'm not sure. Every seems like everybody's using like an R markdown to do notes and stuff. I don't know if there's a link to. to oh yeah, to absolutely. Um, actually, there is. I can send. They should be linked up top. Like if you go to the, if you go to uh, the Slack channel up on top on the ribbon, there should be like a link to the GitHub repos okay. where I can, here it is. Um, so you'll just create a fork. And if you need help with this, just let me know. Um, but you'll create a fork and then you can add to it. But what's nice about this is like previous cohorts have like put material together. Okay. And so you don't necessarily have to reinvent the wheel. Um, and in fact, it looks like somebody actually did some stuff for S4, so. Let's um, right, see, yeah. But I dumped it in the chat for you so you can access it. And if you need help, like if you're not familiar with like GitHub or anything like that, just let me know. I can show you how to do that. So, okay, cool. Yeah, uh, I can do that. Cool. So I think probably next time I'll spend about 10, 15 minutes covering these last kind of four topics really quickly. And then well, we can start our conversation at S4. So right, I can cool. hang out for a little bit while longer if you guys want to talk about some of this other stuff. Um, but yeah, what other questions or comments do people have about where we're at right now? Has anybody, do you, have you used R6 Stone? Um, I haven't. I've sort of looked into using it um, just because of the reference semantics sort of things to avoid copying like super large arrays and stuff. Um, Cause there's like some weird, especially if you're like using RStudio, there's some weird stuff where like, even if it shouldn't be copying, it actually ends up copying a bunch of data anyway, um, which is super annoying. Uh, so I've, I've heard that using R6 is helpful um, to handle that sort of thing um, on top of already using reference semantics. Um, it just like forces some nicer behavior for like really large objects. But other than that, I've, other than, Thinking about maybe using it, I've never actually used it. I tried. I tried using it in a package that I'm doing for work, but like the problem that I had was the idea of like just the abstraction part of it. Like, because mm. like I was thinking about like trying to abstract out like all these different like wrangling steps inside of it, you know, so someone would just like put in the certain things to like do what they needed to do. And then at the end of it, it would just like output like a table and like, you know, a plot or whatever that you needed. But then I got kind of nervous because I was like sitting there, I was like, well, that gets away from the idea of like being able to pipe something with functions. And so I kind of was like weighing this, like I could do this and abstract it away and make it easier for other people to use, but they lose that idea of like the functional programming part where you could use the pipes. And so I kind of had this like existential crisis of like, do I use OOP or functional here? <laughs> so, yeah. and then obviously I went down this rabbit hole and like people are like, 
just choose what you like and what's the best, what you think is best for the certain situation. I'm like, dang, there's no right answer to this. So standard, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah so I'm kind of I, a OOP hater, to be honest. <laughs> I find it not super useful most of the time. Um, and when it is useful, it's usually so obvious that it's useful that it's like, if I'm ever questioning whether it's useful or not, I'm like, okay, it's probably not that useful then. Um, just because I think it's easier to think about data separately and then transforming it. Um, yeah, especially for like data science sort of things. It's data primacy sort of thing. Yeah, it's, like, it's nice to see the steps, right? You're just like, oh, it's nice to see this step, do this step, do this step, apply this function, rather than uh, like abstracting it out instead of like abstracting it out and being like, this one class is gonna do everything for you and just you call this one method and it will call out what you want, uh, you know? And so yeah. it's like, oh, so hey, that's so where I, I had. Just Go a ahead, closing Ron. comment on this active binding thing. It was driving me crazy. I was doing some source diving into the R6 thing. And it turns out like, there is this thing, I guess it's a base R concept I never know about called active bindings. It's not part of R. You can do the question mark, make active binding. And there's some documentation for it. It's part of the, it's part of, uh, the binding environment and base, base R thing. And it has to do with... Oh, well. Like you said, it has to do with environments, and it's, it's some kind of you can install these functions into um, into the base environment somehow. That's as far as I got. But if you're interested in digging more into it, that'd be the, that's the breadcrumb. <laughs> I, may, <laughs> I may dig it. I may follow that trail a little bit further. But is, did we talk about that at all in this book? I don't think so. Right? That's a totally new concept, right? Yeah, it could I've be never... coming up. Go oh, ahead, maybe it's a meta thing. Find the function. Oh yeah, metaprogramming sort of thing. Yeah. I think I've actually have heard about this. Um, oh, it was in chapter seven. Somehow we just like forgot about it because it was like just a brief thing in the advanced binding section. Oh. Environment. Yeah. I yeah I think this uh, I've heard about this actually because um, I asked somebody. So there's like some R packages that will to like, especially if you're doing like um, parallelizing stuff, it'll send it, it'll serialize your data functions, like your yeah. arguments and send it across the pipe to a different computer and then unserialize it and then run the function there. Um, but it always uses save RDS, which is really slow sometimes. So I was like, right. oh, is there a way I can substitute out that save RDS with like a faster version? Um, so there's a, like a package called uh, QS, which is for quick serialize um, and lets you save our object really fast. Um, so yeah, somebody was like, oh yeah, I can use this function to change the binding in the package that you're using and like um, to like swap out that function to do like a faster version. Um, yeah, that's kind of, that's a good use case for that for sure, right? That's really yeah, interesting. Yeah, with, what's also bothers me is that we actually went through that chapter and I'm looking at that section. I don't remember that part at all. <laughs> I know I, I went through it. <laughs> I'm just looking on the sign up to make sure it wasn't me that presented it. Cause that'd be even worse if I presented it and also forgot it, but it was Ryan. So <laughs> maybe he remembers about active bindings, but when you said active bindings, I'm like, Oh, I thought that was just something just special for R6, but it turns out it's a base. Well, well it's, it, where it is in chapter seven, it's it's related to environment, this function called environment bind active. Right. And then it mm -hmm. just, it references like here, reference this function called make active binding. And <laughs> that's <laughs> about it. So we can be, well, forgiven. we can be forgiven for our eyes glazing over and not, not thinking that was very important at the time and not. Yeah, well, training those in, neurons. <laughs> in the book, it says, in the book, the main thing it calls out is that it's used in R6 to implement Oh, R6. okay. <laughs> there you go. So it doesn't really describe it. It's just like, oh, yeah, this is, this is how R6 works. <laughs> it all comes around. <laughs> well, the second time I read this book, I'm going to pay more attention to uh, the advanced the environment sections. <laughs> Well, don't forget either. I think somewhere in the, I think somewhere in the, in the chapter seven, it's like, Hey, just so you know, like this is stuff to read about, but your day-to-day -day use, you don't need to know how to use environments. So right. It prompts you already to say like, Hey, this is interesting stuff, but uh, do you need to know it? Probably not. So I don't know. 
Well, cool. Well, uh, I guess we'll finish up our conversation of good, our six next stuff, week. Colin. Yeah. Yeah. Good cool. Stuff. I think this stuff is cool. Yeah. But uh, useful <laughs> to be determined. <laughs> probably going to promptly forget all about this in about a month. <laughs> <laughs> I think I like functional programming. A yeah, me too. There, me too. There's some certain places where OOP is good, but I just don't see yeah. see me using it in my day to day. But but, hey, I know it now. So, but you will use maybe use somebody else's library that they're using, and then it won't be so alien when you do it. But you don't necessarily yeah. know how to do it all yourself. So that's okay, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, I think well, what Stone brought up the idea of like, you know, how this could be related to Shiny. Like it yeah, that or, that when he mentioned that, it made me like understand like why Shiny syntax is so different. You know, it's because it's leveraging some of these R six concepts of you know methods and classes and so it makes a little bit more sense now but yeah all cool. right very good all right well we'll see y'all yeah. next week so. next week yeah talk very to you later see y'all next right. week bye talk to you later bye